All right, you guys, welcome back to General Fantasy Analysis. We're in for one of those really important videos. Again, going through all the guys that you're thinking about bringing into your side this week and you know, potentially how much money they've got to make. You know, are they a trade in this week? Does it fit your team in terms of having some cover on the bench? Um, you know, is it bringing one of these guys in for a fallen gun, a mid-ranger that's not going to turn into a keeper? Lots of different questions. I'm just going to finish off in the end, just going through the wing fullback position because I think it's really tough at the moment to, to feel that and have some cover as well. And a few guys are you know, trading out certain players and looking to, to bring in a cheaper wing fullback. And I think it's a pretty bad decision at, at this point. Um, you know, and if it's the reason you have to bring them in is one of you guys are out or, or whatever it is, then I'd suggest going up to one of the guns, um, but still not, you know, it's not a super clear decision on that. But anyway, we start with Leo Thompson and he's someone that's you know, doing really well and he continues his, uh, he, he continues to have his spot on the bench. We lose Matt Croker this week. Leo keeps that spot. So 15 in round one, and he's picked up a 38 and 37 minute uh, games in round two and round three. And if you look at his stats here, that, that round three was a really good one for him because he had just had it straight out in base. He had the one penalty conceded, the turnover tackle, so a plus two there overall. But 30 tackles, 58 meters, and obviously you know, defending a fair bit when he was on the park. But he can run up to 92 meters um, in, and 71 meters in the other two games there. So can do it on both sides, which is really, really good, depending on you know, the possession totals there but if we just look at him they're averaging 32.3 if we're happy to say at a minimum he should be able to get a 32 average you know owned by 30 percent of teams now which is pretty cool um and you can look here the the top 100 top thousand and top five thousand you have him so 61 percent the top 100 and 60 percent the top thousand have him so um, that's something that's interesting to have a look at in, in all the different players as well so only this footy stats.com uh, footy statistics.com sorry goes through that but a 32 average he's got at 291k you give him another 100k to make. So if you were looking to pick him up, or he was your only option, or you know someone else was a little bit too expensive, then Leo could be a good one to pick up. Not exactly sure yet. I'm making this video on uh, on the Tuesday night while Barnett is in the judiciary. We might check it at the end of the video see if it's been updated, but um, yeah, not sure how long he's going to be out for. Brody Jones gets the edge position, and Leo keeps his spot you know through the middle. And I think that he he's going to keep that for the, the least the next three to four weeks. You'd say. Until yeah, you know, you've got Clemmer to come back. You know, would Clemmer come back into Mamasia's spot? Does that mean there's less minutes for Leo? You know, if, if any of these guys come back early, there's a slight issue. So if you know, if you have to at this price point get him in your team, then you can. But I, I'd suggest that there are other options that could be a little bit better. That have probably a little bit more runway in a, a little bit more time in the squad. So that's Leo anyway. If you've, you're holding on to him, you, you've got it. You know, probably close to 100k in price rises to come, maybe slightly less. So he's, you know, he's done really well to start us off. If we move to Taylor May, so 335k is obviously a little bit more expensive and, and has a nice break even at, at seven, whereas Leo Thompson is, is at you know zero, if that's correct there. If we want to go by the footy statistics, let me know if this is um, incorrect uh, down in the, in the description below or in the comments, sorry. But Taylor May, 335. So again, that 40k more expensive and is a center. Uh, sorry, is, well, is center in fantasy, but a winger in the in the game. And they come up against a, a better opponent this coming week in the Rabbitohs. So yeah, it'll be a fairly tough matchup, you'd say, for him. And I can see this game being a little bit more lower scoring than what it was on the weekend. It kind of you know they started well, but then it ended up being perfect for him with you know having 12 members on the other on on the Knights um, sideline uh, on the Knights side. So it was much easier going wing to wing left and right for the Panthers. So I doubt he's going to get three tries again. Yeah, what we do see though is he's 162 meters. That's great. I'm probably expecting like a, a 30 to 35 average for him, you know, with some games around the 20 mark and some games around the 45, 50. So just be aware of that. If you are looking to pick him up, you get him in the centers. And, and the good thing here is after, you know, in three more rounds, if he's still in the squad and Brian Tott hasn't magically come back, then he'll get the dual position and you can um, have him there as cover in the wing fullbacks. But just be aware that over that time that Toto is going to be there, he will be out of your squad. Um, I suppose you can use him as a, as, a, as a loop, but he won't be there as cover. What will happen though, is that when Origin comes along, Toto is going to be in there. You know, there's the other thing there, is Staines going to keep his spot? You know, is Taylor May going to take that? I think Staines has played well enough this year to hold it, but yeah, there's something else to think about with Taylor. And just that 40k more expensive than Leo. Um, and, and in, in a center position where we have a lot of coverage, you know, he's actually owned by 19% of the top hundred. So I imagine they've potentially picked him up last week and played him and got that 52. So that's that with Taylor. Let me know what your thoughts are on him. Like the base stats are solid, like the meters gained and everything is, is there. Obviously you've got a couple of errors in his game, the odd missed tackle. So, 
something to think about. But he's only going to get better as he gets older and and, um, and more experienced in the NRL. So that's Taylor May. Brody Jones is the big one we want to talk about this week. Coming in at 325k, he's got a fair bit of runway to, to make some cash, especially if Barnett, like it looks like at a minimum, um, it's going to be four weeks. If he, it sounds like four and then eight plus. So Barnett's team, they want four weeks, saying it was, uh, what do you say, unintentional was the goal. And then uh, the judiciary is looking for eight plus. So I imagine he's going to be unsuccessful, unfortunately. So it'll be eight weeks plus. Um, and then you've got Fitzgibbon, who's probably going to be close to two months as well, six to eight weeks for him from this point onwards. So Brody's got some runway, and if he if he averages what we think he's going to average, he should get to that price point by the time those guys come back. And then he'll probably move to the bench. And at worst, you can have him as a bit of cover there. But anywho, owned by a small percentage. He'll be owned by somewhere between 5 and 10% uh, percent after this, uh, or when, you know, when lockout goes. Obviously owned by no one in the top 5,000 after round three, but that will increase. So what we want to look at with Brody is you know his bigger minute game. So we have one off the interchange for 74 minutes. I'm not actually sure if that was in the centers or not, which he has played a few random games in the centers. So 53 there with a line break, um, a try and also a line break assist. So he's obviously got a little bit of skill there as well. He began off the interchange. So we've got 33 and 33 minutes. So this is just a way to look at um, his work ethic, for example. 46 minutes off the bench with a try and obviously only nine tackles, which was a bit weird, but I'm assuming that's in the centers as well. Second row game. So we look at them. We've got a 42 and a 43 in 75 and 72 minutes, which I think is you know fairly likely for him. And that's with minimal run meters, so 57 and 82. And the tackles there at 34 and 38. So solid there. A couple of errors, a few missed tackles. So not you know not the best games and still getting 40-odd, which is nice. And you can see here, he obviously has a few games where he scores tries, which shows that he has that ability to um, to score well. And if you've watched him to, you know, to the eye, he's actually a pretty solid player and um, would have been close to starting on the edge this year if he didn't have some issues. But you know, it's funny, 2021, round 23, we have a 42 in the 80 minutes. So again, no real attacking stats, just the base, which is cool. A 51 in 80 minutes, which is good. 54 off the interchange, well, you know, basically starting um, in that one as well. And then a, 33, a 31 in 33 minutes. So you see a lot of times he can he manages just to pick up some attacking stats. So these are really, really good numbers if you're looking at you know, he finally gets that opportunity to really cement his spot in the second row and, and hopefully, you know, take that um, and I suppose maintain that position would be it would be his goal, right? So a 325k, I don't feel like there's much of a risk because we've seen him do it before. It's not like Tualangi or those guys or, or Bullimore. We haven't seen them play too much on an edge where we know Brody Jones can, can score well. And he's playing in a Knights team that's doing really well. So I think he becomes a really, really good option and, and probably a priority this week along with um, someone like Starling, if you haven't picked him up yet. So Brody Jones, that's the one to go for. Josh King is the one to think about. So 429K, he moves into a position where it's very hard to pick him up any you know, at any time in the next few weeks and not expect him to kind of level out somewhere around the 500K mark. He scored awesomely to start. And if he continues at 47, he's probably got 100-odd K to make. 150, getting anywhere close to that 550, 600 mark. But I don't see him averaging 47 going forward. I tell you, if you guys watch the team list, um, you know, the live there, I was a bit upset when I saw that he was still named in the 13 and Smith was named at 14. But just if you looked at their bench, they have four forwards on there, whether it's, you know, Luoro Luor, Luor with, with being an edge, but then all the three middles in there as well. Grant might not play 80 this week, so it might just be this thing where um, Smith's going to come on um, for one of the forwards, spend a little bit of time at hooker for Grant to come off for 10 minutes, something like that. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but... That's kind of you know, where we're at with King is if, you, if you've got him right now, you've got to continue holding. I personally wouldn't be looking to bring him in. Just at a 429K, I can't see him averaging 47 from here on out. I just think the minutes will drop. I feel like they have to. He has had three really consistent games, and that's obviously if he's the lock, if that's his position, they're the minutes he's going to get, which might happen one more week, but I don't think it continues happening from there. So... Let me know what you think you know, about him. He's really exceeded expectations. His PPM has been awesome over the first two games. And he got a line break, a couple of line breaks. He's a try, a couple of offloads this game, which is pretty irregular for him. But yeah, I suppose that's the, the thing. Are you going to hold him or, you know, and eventually move him on and, and use his cash when he gets to about 500k? But I wouldn't be picking him up now. It's kind of annoying if you didn't have him. 66 out of the top 100 have him, which makes sense because he's done so well at a cheap price. But yeah, you kind of missed the boat, I think, if, you, if you're looking to pick him up now. Tuolangi, I want to speak about. So 332K, so still really cheap, right? And owned by 17% of people. You know, 64 out of the top 100 have him. 67% of the top 1,000. So that's 670 there. 
break even at 24 is still low enough, and he gets the starting spot back. So I think you could almost play him if he's like your fourth option, if you're looking between him and Ilias, or Billy Walters, those types of guys. Um, you, know, you pick Tuolangi or Leo Thompson is probably the the comparison I'd go for. I'd probably pick Brody Jones over Tuolangi if, we, if you've got him in your squad. Um, but we, you know, we had a nice game from him in round one. 22 tackles was not, a, not heaps, but the three tackle breaks and an offload and 109 metres was what we like to see. Round two against the Knights, he just didn't play very well. Because, we, you know, if we look back again, we see a nice PPM in those couple of games. He scored a try, the back end, a couple of tries back in a 21. So he has that opportunity to do well. Uh, I think he's going to do better than 18. Well, we hope so anyway. Um, you know, 18 tackles, four missed tackles, um, and 46 metres gain. Just wasn't enough. And I suppose the big worry is just that he's a Tigers player. So I'd be holding on to him. If you don't want to play him, don't. But I just don't think he's a trade-out this week when you've got Bullimore, who's an easy trade-out for, for most people that own him. Cool. Kurt Mann, a few people talking about him as being close to a must-have, and you know, 92% 92 of the top 100 have him. You know, He's very highly owned across all the top 5,000, which makes sense, just especially you know, a lot of people, you know, good good coaches started with him, and then if not, they brought him in after he you know, dropped a little bit, or sorry, stayed the same price there, but he, you know, in that 60 to 65 minutes, he has the opportunity to do really well. I don't think he's a must-have, but I think he's a, a strong option in the halves and mids. You can play him in either one, and um, a lower break even now. So I, th I think he'll be someone that bottoms out around the 600k mark, unless he can average 50 um, and, and get a little bit higher than that. But yeah, kind of had, has had a, a nice round three, but don't expect a 73 every week, because it was a perfect game for him. The, the tackles were finally up. I expect him to be somewhere in the high 30s. So that was up a bit higher. He had four tackle breaks, the line break, line break assist, turnover tackle, a bit of everything, right? Um, so that won't happen every time, but it's definitely something to look at, uh, a player to look at anyway. I'm seeing a few people bringing in Andrew Davey. He's got about a 1% increase since lockout change. Uh, owned by a very small percentage of people in the um, the top 5,000. If you look at his two games, so he had 29 minutes in the first one for a nice PPM, two tackle breaks in that, and a turnover tackle. Back to normal in this in this second game with 22 and 54 minutes. So nothing really to happen too much for him. One missed tackle, one uh, penalty. No no running meters really at the 25. He might have been a little bit stressed on the ACL and the wet. I'm not exactly sure, but be someone to... I think you can hold off on. He's not going to make any you know, big cash over the next few weeks being a break-even of break 17. So I think he's someone you can watch. But I understand why people are potentially bringing him in, downgrading and upgrading elsewhere to get Cleary or something like that. But... Yeah, Davies, um, that's where you want to look uh, look at at this stage with Davies. You can probably have him as a wait and see, a bit of a hold. And last one a lot of people are talking about is Kobe Hetherington, a 406k. Again, you're not getting him super cheap, and the, and the goal with him was to get him averaging somewhere around the 40-plus mark, and he started with a 38 average over the two games, the so 33 and 43. He's still, he's still going to be sitting on the bench. We've got Carrigan, um, who's sitting there playing big minutes in the 13 role. So will Hetherington continue with those you know, low, uh, sorry, mid mid to high 30s minutes? I think for the foreseeable future, I, I think he will. You just need his PPM to stay super high with those tackles being really, really good. So until there's an injury or something like that, when he gets a starting spot and he can average somewhere between 40 and 50 points, I think he's just a hold. He's making a tiny bit of cash, but if you, if you have him now, awesome. If you don't, I think just hold off on him. There's a few guys that are a little bit cheaper that I spoke about in here that would be slightly better options at this point. But, you know, if you happen to have a few hookers go down or you need a mid, then then he could be solid as well. But you've got Brady Jones, you've got Leo Thompson, those types of guys. Hetherington's spot's going to be safe in the team. I suppose that's the biggest thing there. All right, last one in this video, guys. I just want to go through the wing fullback. So if we look at this, just the head-to-head -head team, obviously killing it. Um, but the wing fullbacks we have in this squad are Nico Hines. So he's obviously a must-have, I think, in the wing fullback position. Uh, or you can blame in halves, whatever you like, but I think it's better down in wing fullback. You've got Stephen Crichton, who everyone should have, you know, 48%. Anyone who's having a go this year has him. Perhaps another good option at 628, right? Turbo is getting very close to being a, a buy. I think they're going to start to play better. That win's going to help them. They needed that to kickstart their season. So he'll be down the 700s eventually, and he becomes a decent option over the next few weeks, but probably another, you know, another one or two to wait. Uh, Dan Gagai just got a little bit too expensive, I think. 701k for a, you know for, for him being more expensive than Teddy for example, Reese Walsh, Latrell Mitchell, Ponga I think is a bit silly. So you can wait on him. Yes, his dual position it helps, but yeah, he's going to play Origin as well, things like that. To think about Teddy is 671. I think he has the opportunity to to play better. Reese Walsh, so two guys at a similar price that I think are both uh, similar options. Walsh is going to do a lot for its Warriors side, but they they need to improve as a team and mesh better. You know, for him to get good ball either side of the ruck. 
I think so. While she, as much as I think he's a decent option, he's probably, you know, if he was around the 600K, 580, I'd probably go, yep, buy him now. But a 666 with the team not going so well, I think you can hold off a little bit. You've got Luttrell, who's, you know, warming into the season. Ponga has missed a couple of games, so I'd be holding off on him. You know, Gutho, Garrick, uh, Garrick, Farnworth, all like doing solidly. You know, Farnworth had a, a pretty average first game, and then it's got two doubles, and he's still averaging 46. So, you know, Manu's playing decent without scoring well. There's really not much happening down here. You've got Brimson, you've got Holmes, who's had one massive game. If you're going down further and further, Hamiso we've spoken about, I think he's just definitely a hold in this position. If you've got three or four wing fullbacks, and I think that he's definitely a hold. We just need that cover, right? And we have no one really to to plug and play. You know, Dom Young's done well, and that's why people are looking to pick him up. But a 461 for a winger, I, and for someone who's never really been fantasy relevant, I don't think it's a, a, a good way to go. You know, Ty Tyrell Sloan has had a tough start, but is he almost a hold if you if you need a wing fullback? Like, that's kind of the thing there. And Offa Lumos had a, uh, had a tough start, but again, in Tigers, do you want him in your side? Cobo, he hasn't really done well. Moylan, after his negative score last week. Jackson Paulo. Um, yeah, just not, yeah, a bit too expensive for that. Kotrick's done okay. He's back. Tane Milne, again, too low. If you look at all these guys, averaging mid-20s. If Stafford Tour um, continued to play, like, he was really good. I can see why people are going for Moses and why. Rocco Berry hasn't done, you yeah, know, everything we want him to do. Xavier Coates, same thing. Jesse Arthurs, how long does he keep his spot in the teams? Some people are going cheap in semi Valamai. How much, you know, how much time does he have in the squad? Uh, Will Smith's done a job without being spectacular. It's almost worth holding Sean Russell at this point at that cheaper price. If he comes back, or you know, we're not sure how long Sivo has got, uh, got until he comes back. So, yeah, plenty happening in the wing fullbacks. And my suggestion here would just be probably just to hold steady in the wing fullback section. Try and wait for an injury or something to happen and a cheapie gets an opportunity or, you know, if one of your one of your guys go down in a different position or the wing fullback position, you can do something there. But other than that, it's probably just worth just sitting tight on those guys. But... I suppose, guys, I hope this video really helped you with you know, having a deep dive analysis into the, all those potential trading targets this week. And obviously, you know, I've spoken a fair bit about the guys that you should look to trade out. Obviously, Bully, for example, in this team is, is one to think about. If you're looking to upgrade to a Cleary, then maybe using a Jack Bird, a Reed Marnie, these types of players could be ideal. But um, yeah, I suppose the biggest thing here is just, guys, if you enjoy this, please subscribe, like. I love all of you guys being here, and we'll catch you in the next few videos. See you later.